This one's unavoidable. Salinity will rise using two-part. It can happen faster than most people think, and the corrective solutions can have unintended consequences. You guessed it. Water changes the best solution, but in this case, consider how much two-part you use. I'll show you a couple of graphs to demonstrate this in a second. The reason why two parts raise salinity is they're all based on salt. The calcium portion based on calcium chloride, the alkalinity portion based on sodium carbonate or bicarbonate. Once dosed in the tank, the carbonate alkalinity ionizes into the water and leaves the sodium behind. The calcium ionizes into the water and leaves the chloride behind, effectively polluting the tank with excess sodium chloride or table salt in the tank that will raise the salinity. There are not any studies on sodium chloride only elevated salinity on corals, but there are many on general salinity increases like this one. The effects of temperature and salinity on growth, metabolism, and digestive enzyme synthesis of Ganiopora. The Ganiopora could survive in a wide salinity range of 25 to 40 parts per thousand. However, the maximum number and weight of the Ganiopora polyps was determined at 30 to 35 parts per thousand. Furthermore, the 30 to 35 parts per thousand salinity at 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit led to the best Ganiopora growth and survival, mainly because of their enhanced nutrient absorption rate, polyp expansion rate, metabolic rate, and adaptability. Their chart demonstrates this pretty convincingly. After eight weeks, the protein composition of the coral was much lower at 40 parts per thousand salinity than 35 that most reefers maintain, and the fat content dramatically lower at the elevated salinity as well. Salinity clearly played a big role in this experiment. Survival, not the primary measurement, but how these environmental changes stress the animals. So how does this tie back to two-part? Well, every gallon of many popular two-parts have around two cups of salt dissolved in them, so when you finish a gallon of each, you've effectively added four cups of salt to the tank, more when the magnesium included as well. There is a lot of chloride and sulfate in magnesium portions. Ray Holmes Farley's article called an improved do-it-yourself two-part calcium and alkalinity supplement system demonstrates this effect over time with the addition of dosing 1.1 dKH a day to the tank and matching amount of calcium and alkalinity. After one year with no water changes, the salinity rises 32%. That'd be a salinity of 47 parts per thousand or about one point of dKH per month. Again, not the kind of pollutionary problem that shows up in a single dose or even a month of doses. Considering the study that we just mentioned, it might show up as we approach five months, but not in mortality, but in harder to define decreases in health and stress. The two-part article does demonstrate the effect of water changes on the sulfate portion of the article's recipes once water changes are considered. Where zero water changes has the expected perpetual rise to nowhere good, 7.5 to 15% monthly slows the progression, and 30% monthly changes has a small rise and then stabilizes. This is the reason why most two-part manufacturers fully expect you to perform water changes, 30% a month looking like an effective number here. This does bring up the question alternatively to water changes. If the tank has risen a few points of salinity to say 38.5 parts per thousand, why not just manually dilute the tank by taking some of the salt water out of the tank and replacing it with fresh water? That would effectively lower the salinity 10% back down to the standard 35 parts per thousand, but it also lower everything else along with it. Alkalinity from 9 to 8.1, 420 calcium will drop to 378, and 1300 magnesium to 1170. They all need to be then corrected back up by adding more salt to the tank. This of course has cascading effects on all the other major and minor and trace elements that we don't commonly test for, which is a bit mad scientist for me. At this point, it's probably clear why the sodium chloride and resulting elevated salinity from two parts is considered a polluting element in the tank. It certainly meets the definition of pollution, a substance that has harmful or poisonous effects in sufficient quantities, and why most additive manufacturers rely on us to perform a reasonable water change schedule to dilute that challenge and make it a moot point. However, there are caveats to every rule. Some two parts account for the excess sodium chloride in their formulation and much better options for those who choose to do fewer water changes. Tropic Marine's balling method and Triton's method and Core 7 come to mind. Tropic Marine's balling method addresses the sodium chloride problem this way. They know that they're adding in calcium alkalinity and sodium chloride every single day. Salinity will rise. We'll have to take out some salt water and dilute the tank, which at which point every major minor trace element will drop along with that. An ongoing problem that just gets worse with every time that you do it. So when the Bali method was designed, they added a part C. Part C is everything that's in the aquarium salt mix, but they leave out the sodium chloride because the sodium and chloride are in their part A and B two part. Now when the tank goes up 3% or one part per thousand salinity, it's not just the sodium chloride that went up 3%, every material element also went up 3%. So when you dilute the tank back down, they all go down evenly and maintain balanced levels. Now it's very likely that in a minimal water change environment, that acknowledgement and addressing this challenge has a very material effect on the 12 to 36 month results of a reef tank. 
However, in a more aggressive water change environment where the imbalanced water is removed and replaced with balanced water consistently, it's debatable how valuable the Part C or sodium chloride free sea salt is. At this point, many reefers are probably thinking, I've never had to manually dilute my tank by removing salt and replacing it with fresh water, or at least that's pretty rare. Good chance that's because your water changes are enough to prevent the need for that, but even more likely you're diluting and didn't even know it via your protein skimmer. If your skimmer pulls out a cup and a half of effectively really dirty seawater each day, your auto top off is going to replace it and dilute the tank for you. In a month, a cup and a half a day of skimmate removal is roughly three gallons of salt water removed and replaced with fresh water or 3% dilution in a 100 gallon tank and enough to account for the excess sodium chloride addition from two parts of many tanks. A high functioning skimmer can serve a wide variety of uses. Another multi-part that accounts for the excess sodium chloride in its formulation so it isn't an issue is Triton's Core 7. Rather than use a sodium chloride free Part C like Tropic Marin, they've told me that the Core 7 counts on wet skimmate for dilution and the four part additive contains the right amount of additives to acknowledge and account for the necessary dilution from the skimmer and ATO. This makes sense because the Triton method is built upon doing test result reactionary water changes rather than proactive or preventative water changes. So accounting for the excess sodium chloride in their formulation is a necessity. With all this discussion and reliance on water changes, it begs the question, is a salt mix a source of pollution as well?